Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Can you believe that this is happening again? No, not so really. Very, so very soon. And by soon, I mean, what, a year or something? I don't know. what. I don't even know what day it is. It's been a really long time. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with all-night web surfer jag, Michael Kester. And, uh, oh, already it is coming. Wow, we're kicking it off early. What are we doing today? Today we're going to do all of the Wishmaster movies in the existence of the planet. So you mean both, one and two, right? Both Double one feature? and two, and three and four. We're doing a Killapalooza again. Yeah, I, we are doing a Killapalooza, and I guess we should note that it may not seem like a Killapalooza because there's only four films, and we're used to doing ten, yeah. eight maybe, at the, at the least. I think we did a five once. That was what was Children the of the Corn like? Fourteen films. Children of the Corn. I don't 14 know. Fourteen too many. Is Fourteen how many too was. many is how many. Very good. Uh, but so we're doing four films. Yeah, yeah. Not the usual copious amount of films, but you know this is probably all the Wishmaster films they ever needed to make. Yeah, for the people who loved the Killapalooza series for the agony that it drove us through, we got plenty of that in these four films. So don't worry about that. And we're going to do the same length of show we would do if this was nine films. Mm-hmm. So we're bringing all of that stuff back. Uh, basically, if, if you weren't around um, back when we talked about this, we had a Killapalooza crisis where we just sort of ran out of franchises. Yeah. And Wishmaster is what we consider a somewhat notable franchise. Sure. Um, there's certainly notable things it does, and the people who were in it, it I think that's what kind and of attracted involved. us. Yeah, right, right. And so we're bending the rules for that. We want to, uh, to be able to talk about that, even though it's four films. And you know what? If they do a fifth Wishmaster film, we'll, we'll fucking do that and chuck it on the show somehow, sure. too. The biggest thing to take out of all this is that Killapaloozas are back. Killapaloozas Everybody are back. missed Killapaloozas. Yeah. Our I'm included Killap- in that group. <laughs> I know. I was di- I, Seriously, I was so ready to do this. I was really, really excited until we started watching the films. Yeah. That's what happens. That's mean. I shouldn't say that. No, I was excited the whole time. I'm still excited. So yeah, we should uh, we should mention we're doing this the same day that we're watching the Killapalooza wow. films. We're just really coming back hardcore on these things. Well, trying anyways. So there's going to be some spoilers I'm in here. Spoil them, and uh, there's chapters to evade the spoilers. This is definitely one of those franchises that I think people are going to come and listen to this episode because they don't want to watch the mm-hmm. Wishmaster films. They probably couldn't even find the Wishmaster films. We thought that about Children of the Corn, though. That's I don't true. know. Yeah. I don't know. Did we mention this on the year end last? I don't know what happens on the year end shows. Sure. No, I try and forget about those as soon as um, possible. But I know that we did at least get an email about somebody who Children of the Corn was their favorite favorite franchise horror series yeah. and. We kind of ripped it apart, maybe a little bit unjustly. We say that now. Sure, uh, sure. But we wouldn't watch all eight of those again. Time heals all wounds. And uh, so we're going to, we're going to definitely do some of our due diligence on Wishmaster so as not to disappoint the one Wishmaster is the best franchise fan that's listening to our show right now. So, like I said, there's spoilers. Be warned about that. And uh, we'll just move straight into the first film, I suppose. Sure. That's a lie, because I want to talk about Wes Craven. All right, Wes Craven. Do you think it's worth it to... I mean, we're going to do it either way, but Wes Craven's not really that involved, is he? Okay, if you were to walk up to me and tell me, hey, movie coming out, Wes Craven produced it, I would fucking bet my balls that Wes Craven woke up from a bad dream and told one of his fucking lackey writers about it and then got the producing credit. Well, I figured this way, what we can do is just get all the ripping out of the way on Wes Craven mm-hmm. because he totally deserves I mean, there's nothing defensible about Wes Craven. I re- Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, but New Nightmare pretty much nullified all sure, of Sure, I right? know. <laughs> so let's get all of our negativity now that we've finished the franchise out of the way just in talking about Wes Craven. Uh, I think that's a conversation that you're going to have anytime you talk to somebody about Wishmaster because it is... Wes Craven's Wishmaster. Why, though? Oh, I don't know. He took his name off after the first movie anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter that much. Got a faggy haircut, too. Can you slow down with the uh, ad hominem here before... <laughs> Sorry. Just allow me to get out the, the legitimate evidence and, uh, and criticism against him, mm-hmm. and then we can talk about his haircut. Okay. Would that be okay? Apologize. Fully apologize. I thought this would be a good place to kind of talk about this because we rip on Wes Craven a lot and mm-hmm. we've probably explained it before, but sure. you know, three years ago or something. So who knows? 
uh, this movie is really, really emblematic of a lot of the stuff I don't like about Wes Craven. Yeah, me too. Even if he only produced it, mm-hmm. I can see so much of it. I at least understand why he identifies with this project, yeah. even if he did nothing. And you know what? If I had to pick one scene in the whole movie that embodies that perfectly, it's the stillness scene. In the beginning, the uh, the basketball, you know what I'm talking right, about, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, where she's coaching basketball for seemingly no reason. Uh-huh. And she's explaining, so this is, what is this, 15 minutes into the movie or something? Probably. We're just winding down from uh, from this big opening scene, which we'll get to. And uh, we're kind of learning about our characters and, and getting, um, I hesitate to call it backstory. But we're, we're setting a lot of stuff up. Mm-hmm. And then one of the things we're setting up so deliberately is this, this anecdote, this little, uh, it's not a story, but this little motivational speech sure, yeah. about stillness. Yeah, it's hamster stillness. There's no reason for it to be there. It's so, so early. I mean, unjustly. You know, even if it's the first scene in a film, then you come back to it later. I mean, you forget about it because it was the first scene and you move on to other more important things and then you come back to it and a lot of movies do that. But this is, we, we're winding down from the all the stuff that happened in the beginning that we will forget about. And then we have this jarring speech about stillness. There, there's just no reason for it to be there. But there is a reason for it to be there. Because sure. you know why it's there. Yeah. It's coming back. It's clearly coming back. And it doesn't even service a, a double purpose. It's not like it's relevant in the story right. and also it will come back. Yeah. Why are we there with the bath? It, there's, it's just... There's no reason to they, be there, They Michael. do reuse the basketball court for a later scene. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> yeah, right. It's probably a budgetary thing, uh-huh. but uh, the Wishmaster man in his dashing blue suit does show up and watch little girls play basketball in his weird. free time. Yeah, a little creepy. A little unintentionally. Uh, yeah. Unintentionally I, creepy. I don't think there was any forethought there. So just, uh, we'll get to it later. No, we're going to get to it right now thing about having a little girl basketball scene at all is anybody who's there that's not a parent or coaching is a fucking creep i guess you could just really be a fan of the sport i'm not going to pretend to know anything about how sports work even sports for little girls so i see that and i see west craven but i also see a lot of these scenes that are going to crop up later in wishmaster Mm -hmm. these scenes that crop up out of nowhere no reason for them to be there. They don't make any sense. And we leave them as soon as we came in. Sure. There's just some kind of gimmick or idea that went in with that scene. It doesn't flow with the rest of the movie at all. Um, but it, we'll, we'll point those out as they come in. The other Wes Craven thing that this just uh, reeks of is not having any tact to yeah. it. You know, the things that it does, and, and this is what makes it so bad, is that the movie thinks it has tact. Stuff like the crossfades, sure. right? How it will artfully fade from one scene to another. It's not artful though. Mm-hmm. It just looks really, really corny. But you know that the movie it's that scene in in New Nightmare where Wes Craven is talking to the right. camera. Right. And a lot of the bullshit corny stuff that happens in Wes Craven movies, you can uh, stuff like the movie Cursed, right? That's uh-huh. just full of them and you kinda roll your eyes at it and you enjoy your brainless fun and you get out of there. But in a movie like New Nightmare, Wes Craven sits down and pretends to say something profound. Sure. And that's what this movie kind of feels like to me is that there's these scenes where it's, oh, this part is profound and look how this is moving seamlessly from one place to another. Until the shit hits the fan. <laughs> right. Right. Then stuff like that happens, right? The killer literally says, the the magical killer, the mystic killer of ye olden time of- Of the 10th century um, Persia. Of a humanity so long lost that they have no hold on on today's present, says the shit is going to hit the fan. No, it, hit, it did hit the fan. Right. He it hit reveals the fan. his true self. Sure. He reveals that the shit he is, is currently hitting the fan. Exactly. As we speak. Did you see that right there? You know what that was? The shit hit the fan. That's what that was. And uh, talk about a lack of tact. You know, you have that forced exposition scene with her sister, which is, uh, you know, she knows exactly what happened in the lab. She shows up and she has all the answers. And that happens a couple times throughout the Wishmaster films. Somehow a character knows all the answers and you stop and wonder yourself, wait a second. How do they have any of that information? Doesn't matter. Moving right along. But beyond that, in the, the first movie, there's also that's followed up by, you know, you rescued me from that fire. I know I couldn't get mom and dad out. And it's giving me all these. Tr- you know, wh- why are we talking about this? People don't talk like that. Only in Wes Craven's mind. I really hope maybe he just has these conversations. Yeah. That, maybe that's how people talk to him. It's and then possible. it's totally excusable. 
that would make me so happy if that were yeah, if but, that were how you know, it really I'm not worked. even going to go ahead and say he really wrote any of this film. No, that's true. Because you know, he probably had something to do with the storyline of and she has this this fucked up background where her sister and her family was in a fire and she saved only her sister and her parents died and that will be relevant in a painting at when after after the statues but before the other thing but then she'll just wish it all away. That's how Wes Craven is. That in my sounds brain. like a Wes Craven plot to me. Certainly, certainly does. You know, the other thing I notice in a lot of his movies, and there's different schools of thought uh, on this. I think one of the writers, maybe David Stevie, talked about this, or I can never remember what happens on air, or off air in the interviews because we end up talking to these fuckers for so long. But um, I remember somebody was talking to us about the school of of horror writing where you need a scare every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just kind of a convention. And we saw the opposite of that when we saw House of the Devil, and that worked brilliantly. Yeah. I mean, that was fantastic. But a lot of people think if you're going to get asses into seats and you're going to create the Friday night, you know, October scare movie, then it has to have some kind of murder or killing or outburst of, you know, teenage sex or whatever every 15 to 20 minutes. 20 mm -hmm. pushing it. You yeah. want to have one yeah. every 15 minutes. And you can definitely feel that in Wes Craven films, although he doesn't really like to get to the horror element until later. So it's always just these fake scares. People these with masks. Out, yeah, right. Shouting boo from behind a corner. It's always that shit. And it's I, the cat in the cupboard is what it is. Yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, and that feels fraudulent to me. God, I hate it when it happens. You know, if somebody earns a good scare, I mean, you've been sitting with me when this happens. I usually laugh really hard. Like, wow, applause to you. You deserve that. Uh, or I'll, you know, shout God damn it really, right. really loudly. But I, when it's a boo moment, everybody kind of groans like, oh, come on. And I think that's what Wes Craven wants to happen. But that doesn't make it something to be celebrated. Well, and the other thing that happens in this movie that's kind of a sorry excuse for a scare shot is they'll be doing something and then something seemingly bad will happen followed by a loud explosion of what you didn't expect to blow up. Right. In right. the very first scene when the laser cuts the, what is it, the fire opal in this one? Right. Cuts that into fours. Then the whole fucking lab explodes. Yeah. And that's scary because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't oft expect a lab to blow up. Yeah, for no reason. Exactly. And the film does it three or four times. Sometimes people blow up. There are various and sundry things exploding throughout this film, and it's just to make you jump because explosions are far more intense than the lack thereof. There's that wonderful scene where the plane explodes. Yes. And it's just what meat and cotton meat and cotton in there. Yeah. It doesn't look like a plane explosion at all. You almost go, what did I just look at there? Yeah. But all right. So just to be really, really clear, I wanted to talk about a lot of that stuff because that's how I feel Wes Craven's other movies are. I don't want to specifically attribute it to him in this movie because he's only producing and, and we don't know what producers do. Yeah, right. Little, if any, of that stuff I just complained about in this movie. I, I think it's very representative of Wes Craven. Sure. I don't think it's his fault this time. Faggy haircut. Yeah, but, you know, I didn't want to blame the, the franchise. So I'm, I'm happy laying blame on Wes Craven for no reason. Let's talk about something that's awesome and maybe a, a point we never reach again in the franchise. This opening scene is magnificent. Right. So this is a little bit different than our modern day stuff. So imagine you're in 1127 AD mm -hmm. in Persia. I mean, so basically, you know, your typical 12th century Persian party. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So imagine you're there and the shit hits the fan in Persia in the 12th century. It's the same shit hitting the same fan, but it eventually hits it later in present I was going to say same shit, different fan. Same shit, different fan. That's continue. fine. So it's kind of this party, and we don't have any fucking idea what's going on. Right. Bunch of Persian folks having a, a great swell party, time. I think is what a that swell is. swell party. And then stuff just starts happening. Violent, horribly bloody Oh my God, things everywhere. Things start happening. Yeah. People are being impaled. Skeletons are crawling out of bodies. There's an alien reference yeah I, I mean it's probably not an alien reference because alien wasn't made in the 12th century sure that would be why the movie is also not ripping off of star wars right because t star wars wasn't made in the 12th century although it was a long time ago in a galaxy far far away that's true even my star wars nerd cred does not uh, extend to knowing the actual 
start fake date. year that it, I don't think anybody really I'm sure there's a date somewhere in the world we're getting an email as as you speak that will feature show at gmail.com I don't care about Star Wars what I do care about is Persian parties going horribly wrong yeah so the action is just everywhere there's a point where a skeleton pops out of a man just rips out of him and then starts attacking I mean it really is magnificent and uh, and I'm sad when it goes to modern times. I wanted only, that back. Only briefly, because it goes to modern times, and then immediately Robert England and Ted Raimi walk into frame. So those are two of the big names. I want to hit Robert Kurtzman right away, because uh, we're just never going to get back to him. That's true. And he's somebody who's interesting. We've seen him about a hundred times yeah. on the show before. Um, you know, Predator, but also in the, um, not directing, but in the makeup department sure. of Predator. and. Also on Halloween, Misery, I mean, the, one of the Jason films, New Nightmare, which we talked about, the third Texas Chainsaw Massacre, even did a couple of the Eli Roth things. Um, I think it was both of the Hostel films, if not at, at least the first one, and then uh, Cabin Fever as well, and The Devil's Rejects. Yes, The Devil's Rejects. I mean, just to look at the guy's body of work in, um, in creature effects and in makeup it's really, really amazing. And so to see a scene like that opening one, I mean, it's no surprise that yeah. that exists. That's something that I'm sure he was just dying to do as Motherfucker a knows his shit. So the three names that you roped me in to this franchise yeah. with were what? Robert England. Freddy Krueger. Tony Todd. Candyman. Kane Hodder. Jason. So let's get the tricky one out of the way. Tony yeah. Todd is in this film. Tony Todd is in the film. However, we thought he was the first one you saw, or rather heard. Right. Uh, I think Tony Todd is most well known for his voice. Yeah, right? absolutely. You for hear sure. that voice and you know right away. Unfortunately, the uh, gentleman playing Wishmaster, um, Andrew Divoff, who we won't get to a lot in this one, we'll talk about in in the second one a little bit more, um, is kind of doing a Tony Todd impression. Yeah, uh, to the point where there is actually a Todd off. Sure, that happens yes. when he's talking to the character that Tony Todd himself is playing. So Wishmaster and the the party, but there's a lot of bouncers in yeah. these movies. I think almost every film has it's some bouncers. bouncer that there's an altercation sure. with. Or a version of a bouncer. Yeah, whether it's at the casino or at an exclusive party, the bouncer isn't getting what he wants in life. Wishmaster wants him to make a wish. And so they're both talking to each other in these low, gravelly voices. And uh, I thought it was kind of a joke because Tony Todd was the voice yeah, I thought of the so Wishmaster. Too. I really thought so. Yeah, but we couldn't find that credited anywhere, uh, nor mentioned online. And Tony Todd's not credited in the second film, which sounds like the it's same pretty voice close. to me. Yeah. So I'm going to say Tony Todd probably just has a cameo, like a lot of these other people who sure. show up. Um, Kane Hodder is pretty easy to spot he in is. the game of Spot the Hodder this time around. Um, Kane's always playing a, a role like this. He He's always seems always to be security. The security guard. Yeah, right, right. That was uh, Jason 9 as well, right? Where he was the security yes. guard at the facility. Yep. And so the scene that Kane is in has to be a chain of the worst variety. I mean, it is a, it's a virtual buffet of CGI, and it is all it's garbage. terrible. It's, it's total garbage. I mean, it's it's funny we um we talk about Candyman with Tony Todd. Right about the time we did Candyman, we also did Lawnmower Man. Yes. Which for some reason I always associate the two. And um up to that point, that was about the worst CG we'd ever seen mm-hmm. on the show. Well, that was kind of the goal of that show. Sure. Go sure, back certainly. and listen to it. There was kind of a whole CG undertone to that show. I think our conversation about CG was more subtle than the CG in the film. Um I don't know if I'm gonna say that this movie's CG rivals that of uh <laughs> of lawnmower man but i will say that there's there's just way more of it it's true he kind of freezes he turns into a part of the glass kane hodder's voice is still screaming uh-huh. but the image on the screen is static well the and wish the wish in mm-hmm. question is he he sends he sends wishmaster away right and then says i'd like to see or if you're gonna get through this door you have to get have to through go, me and yeah. then he says i'd like to see that and so wishmaster turns around Turns him into the door and then walks through the door. And then the door explodes into three giant shards of computer animated glass. Yeah. And if you think that that is the worst cop out of a wish, we can go back to Tony Todd for the crowning achievement of wish cop outs. I think possibly, well, definitely in the first two movies, maybe in the first two movies, never mind just the first movie. So Tony Todd is a bouncer. We'll get to Robert England. He's our third, but he's also a more important character, so we can save him. Tony Todd is a bouncer, and apparently he's very unhappy, as you said. He's an unhappy bouncer. Poor mm-hmm. guy. Been there. I felt oh, yeah, that was one of your three 
two day yeah. jobs that Bill you've for had. him personally being an unhappy bouncer. So he gets the choice of not being a bouncer anymore. He decides he wants to escape. You know, he just he wants to get out of there. So Wishmaster gives him the chance to escape. All right, now before you deliver on this, if you could explain the concept of the Wishmaster films. Okay. Because we've come this far and people might be wondering, you know, Freddy's got some claws and Jason is the mask and the machete. All of these killers, you know, Chucky's a doll. I mean, we could go through any of these franchises and explain Chains and hooks. what the yeah, what the concept of the franchise is. And a lot of times it's right in the title. Now, Wishmaster, uh, you would think maybe you could figure it out. Sure. But you're going, ah, eh, that's a little too obvious. Could you mm-hmm. really just explain to people uh, what the idea is? Here? All right. So essentially, the basic mechanism for the Wishmaster's atrocities is that he doesn't quite understand idiomatic phrases, different things that people are saying. He's not really... Hyperbole metaphor, not exactly. versed in those things. And so this results in a lot of hiccups and mishaps when people wish non-specifically. So, for example, if I were to wish to escape, I might end up in a tank of water in a straitjacket chained up drowning. Uh, so, the the concept is be careful what you wish for. That becomes, let's say, More redundant. than just a tagline. Can we say redundantly clear? Is that, well, is that all right? Uh, yeah, it's redundantly clear. It's literally redundant in the film. He says it three or four times. Yeah, it's the yeah. title. Or yeah. tagline, rather. I'm sorry. The title is Wishmaster. Yeah, yeah it's, the, you know, it's the line on the poster. So much so that neither of us knew that, but we both kind of chuckled about it, Uh and then we looked it up, and that is, in fact, the tagline of the film. Uh, But, you know, be careful what you wish for. That stupid thing about outsmarting, you know, the wish master. He's a genie. He's a fucking genie. Yeah, right. And you want to be very careful in your wording. That's dumb because it's easy. You know, you can never think of everything that the wish master might do. I mean, you would literally have to be there for hours describing your wish. Let's just right now, let's do a thought experiment. You give me a specific wish. Try to be as specific as possible, and I will kill you with it. I would like a piping hot, delicious pizza. I could burn you to death with the pizza. I could right, cook you right, into sorry, the pizza. Sure, I said piping hot. Okay. <laughs> Already, just in this experiment, my, uh, my want to add descriptors and colorful language to uh, every stupid thing I say. Be has, careful. Has really come back to haunt me. It'll get you killed. Yeah, but you're right. You could do it with anything. I mean... No matter know, how specific. You want him to do your laundry, maybe he'll put you in with the laundry. Sure. He won't take the clothes off first. Sure. I mean, you ask for a nice car, maybe he runs you over with it. Or it falls from the <laughs> sky. Yeah, the car just falls from the sky. I was thinking really hard. I was like, okay, let's say... I was just Well, using, that's what the movie begs you I was to do, using right? the example of a car. Mm-hmm. I want a car. So you I'm, don't because you live in Chicago. Right, but, but I'm if saying you did. hypothetically, my goal is to wish myself a car. So I would say something like, I want a car that will not hurt me in any way. Right. Parked on the street outside of my home that I can use as a normal vehicle. And, and I will be absolutely in love with having this car. Something like this. But what will end up happening is like I, I just in, in describing, I use the phrase in love with the car. So I'd probably sure. like get my cock stuck in the gas, right, the possible. gas thing. Or you forgot to mention that the car was not full of dirty homeless people. That's true. And they'll all be living inside your car or that your car is illegally parked and that they'll tow it away. And That's then right. you don't get the car or that at all. You've wasted your wish. In the right. first place. Right. I mean, there's just so many things that could go wrong. So it's it's a stupid thought experiment. Because there's no getting around every possible little thing. Having said that, all right, so there's your map for this franchise. This Tony Todd kill is so fucking lazy. Because he he has to escape, right? That's what he wants. Being in a sort of magician's tank a la The Prestige, right? Sure. Uh, That's not actually escaping. It's actually the opposite. It's the opposite of escaping. That's confinement. That's isolation. That is drowning to death. Instead, what it was is it made him an escape artist. Right. Or or rather, it didn't. It put him in the place of an escape artist. Right. And it's, you know, that's the thing is I could have imagined so many ways just in the performance or in the scripting, you could use sarcasm. Yeah, I want to escape. I want to be a fucking escape artist. Like, bam, there, sure. done. You get to use the same stupid thing you were trying to write in there. But someone just got lazy and, and dropped the ball there. I hate that. Well, the reality about that scene that's just so sad is that all the genie, the djinn, the wishmaster, I, we're, I'm going to call them nine different things. Sure. The wishmaster 
just needs to get through security, which I don't understand why sometimes he needs to get, nah, by security, get through security and Plot other times he can appear fine. next to your car. Sure. We accepted it for something like Leprechaun. We can accept it for Wishmaster. The thing that blows my mind is he asks to escape. All he would have to do is move him away. Mm-hmm. He doesn't need to maliciously destroy right, him right. in some egregious thing that's out in front of this party. But you can't complain that the slasher is slashing. That's true. I mean, that's what happens in any of these movies. Slasher's gone slash. Uh, you know, to think about Halloween. I mean, uh, the second Halloween movie, he just needs to get to Lori. He goes out of his way to go to a party and kill some people, kill a chick in a van. I mean, they, they're just kind of along the way. Might as well get rid of them while you're sure. there. So to get back around to the other cast members, as we've now covered basically everything in Wishmaster we were going to talk about anyways. Um, let's see. We got uh, Kane Hodder, Tony... D- green Shirt Guy was oh, the guy, the actor. The reason we saw this, all Green, about shirt, green guy. shirt Guy. No, that's not true. But seriously, what the hell was going on with he that guy? He was disgusting. Far and away, the worst actor I think we've ever seen in a kill... Maybe the worst actor I've ever seen in a film. That was awful. That guy is obnoxiously bad. But so the, the, uh, the other name. Oh, uh, Robert England. Yeah, who's, name. who's credited, you know, Robert England as... It, Beaumont or something like yeah, that. Right. The, uh, the kind of art dealer. Yeah, so Robert England is... He's the, he's the crux of the film. He is of no note in the film. His character is entirely useless. Mm-hmm. But he is the Except reason... Except to make a wish, which is the only reason anyone is in the exactly. film. Exactly. He is, he is the reason that the statue of Agamemnon Magna... It's got a car name in it, too. Mazda. There's a Mazda. Ohora Mazda? That's the one. My Persian pronunciation is actually relatively good, unlike, say, my Spanish or, or Italian. English. Or English, for that matter. So he's the reason this statue was brought over. It ends up being the death of another cast member that we already touched on. Ted Raimi dies in the first five, ten minutes of the film. That's beautiful to see Ted Raimi. Anytime you see Ted Raimi, you know he's going to die right away. I mean, he barely gets any lines out. He gets more lines the second time around. Sure. But uh, he walks under a crate, and then a guy... You know, derp dirt der drops his gin or whatever. Don't alcoholic. say gin. I don't. <laughs> oh yeah, right. His um vodka. I don't yeah. even know the names of alcohol. I don't either. His absinthe in a flask. It's probably his cranberry juice. Is what he was That's putting in there. Too much cranberry and juice. He drops it into the controls, and so the crate cartoonishly falls onto Ted Raimi, killing him and Beautiful. smashing the statue. And then somebody takes the the gem, the, the fire, fire opal. opal. The fire, fire opal. opal. You have to get the mythology right here. Very important. So it's the fire opal. They take it, and that's where all the gins live. Yes. You don't know that now. Nope. But that'll get retconned in later. All the gins live in this fire opal. He always seems so lonely when we see him in he, there. He's. I guess he's hanging out there. And then Robert England ends up trying to throw a comparable swell party, which ends entirely the same way with more living statues. Yeah. yeah. And not hot fuzz living statues. Real Night at the statues museum, living to statues life. is that's what it. that is, and we get a we get a Jack the Ripper cameo as well. Yeah, that's not a cameo. That's just awful. It became obvious early on that we can't accept Wishmaster as a a charming series that we'd like to watch over and over, but we can find some pretty incredible things in it that mm-hmm. tell us more about our other slasher films, sure. and that uh, that seem to get exchanged back and forth through these different franchises. The one thing I did mention earlier, before I forget that Wishmaster will continue doing is having these um, these scenes that are just one-off. They don't make any sense in the context of the film. And this one is, isn't even that bad when you look at it overall. There's well, that just, eye jar scene. It's one scene. of your unnecessary scare shots that you were talking about from before. Yeah, right. These two kids are walking around a hallway. They're scientists or students or something. Studentists. And uh, the one kid throws up a, a jar of eyeballs. And the other guy goes, hey, why'd you do that? Ha ha, don't do that. It scared me. And that's it. These two guys are basically never seen again. The one guy does have um, a couple lines with Wishmaster just something about his eyes coming out, which seems to almost relate back to the eye jar gag, but it doesn't. No, it doesn't at all. at all. And you never see these guys again. So what this is, if you could imagine this in storytelling, right? Just, oh, let's take away the movie for a second and pretend I'm just telling you the story of Wishmaster. We're hanging out one night like I'm I'm retelling you a story of something funny that happened to me or whatever. I'm telling you this um, this this big, long tale about how I started working on this thing and whatever. And here's the different plot points and. And then randomly I go, oh, you know what else was funny? The other day I was walking down the hall and my neighbor popped out and said, whoa, jar of eyeballs. And that was it. That's dead on. That's absolutely what I mean, it would be even worse because I'm at least in that story. Right. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm telling you a story about things that happened to me. And then I tell you about a different day, just randomly inserted, Uh, completely irrelevant. 
But sorry, to get back to Notable, we talked to what's what franchise was it where we talked about um, photos of you? Uh, that was Leprechaun, that was Leprechaun, right? Leprechaun yeah. yeah. I believe maybe the second one. I think that was, it was before it was, Vegas. Pre Vegas was the second one. So what was photos of you briefly? Photos of you is uh, it's a, a song you may not have heard of by <laughs> the Cure. <laughs> exactly. It's uh, it's this brilliant film technique that they use in shit '90s horror. Look and at I mean these things in, we wouldn't have learned if we didn't start watching direct to DVD movies. I mean it in the most endearing way. Yeah, when yeah, I for say sure. The, when I say the phrase "shit '90s horror," I want you to know that all those words are capitalized, and there's little hearts over. Over all the eyes certainly but it's where they pretend that they're using a cure song but they couldn't get the rights so they just make a song that sounds exactly the same as and as a cure song so if you um and this happens with a lot of different music we'll see it with some even more awful music later uh in the franchise but if you remember back to leprechaun there is a cure song if you don't listen to the cure it's called pictures of you it's a pretty popular sure. cure song and uh because they can't get rights or they don't want to pay for it or for whatever reason They wrote a song that sounds eerily reminiscent of that. Um, We call it Photos of You. I don't even think it had lyrics. No, it didn't. Yeah, just because it sounds like that. Here, it's another Cure song. Sure. When they're in the, I think it's the department store, it's once again, it sounds like a Cure song. It sounds like a forest. Right. We can call it a woods. Yeah. The song, uh, the Cure song, A Forest. It's almost the same progression and um, the same kind of tone to the instruments. It's really obvious when you go back and look for it. So one huge credit I want to give to the film, whether it deserves it or not. And then we can talk about the second Wishmaster and finally get to who is the Wishmaster. Who is the true Wishmaster? Well, there's some discrepancy there. But the thing that I wanted to say was uh, I was glued to this movie trying to figure out where the fuck it was going. Yep. I had no... Did you know where this movie... I how had no long idea. until you kind of figured this movie it out? It wasn't until... Well, there was the moment where I turned to you and explained it all to you and then went on to say, the movie didn't tell me that. I was just <laughs> thinking about it for this long. Yeah, it chooses to not explain a lot of this stuff to you. And then it kind of fills in details, even in the second movie, that go back and, and whether those are retconned in or whether those are literally things that maybe just got cut out of the first movie or don't make sense... When you go back and watch the first movie, knowing that stuff, I assume because we've only seen it once, um, those details do just fit right in there. Uh-huh. You know, things like the other um, the other gins actually living in there or just other small details like that completely work in the context of what's going on. Make total sense. Even though you don't see them, uh-huh. uh, you know, they could live in there. And uh, so you just know that going through the next time. As I was watching the movie, I did not know what the end game was. And that kept me really intrigued. Sure. I wanted to know what what were the rules with these wishes? Why are some people just getting killed? They only get one wish. Then there's three wishes. And later the franchise will go to just beat those things into the ground. You know, I mean, I don't know about you. I know the rules. I could recite them oh, on absolutely. a written fucking test right now. Yep. Because they use the same stuff over and Which over. Which is and that's over. a credit to the franchise because if you look Very at something solid, you know if them. you look at something like Leprechaun, things change <laughs> right. so violently from one from one film to the other. Yeah. Something as simple as one person gets three wishes, everyone else gets one wish and dies. They stick to that, more power to them. And even when the franchise's own internal logic doesn't work, it consistently does things like the wishes. Right. We never really know how the wish has to be framed. Sure. But we never, never really know how the... It's not like eventually we figure out it has to be done this way. They do it different ways in different movies, and then they'll occasionally uh, go back and do it you know, the old way right. or do it kind of a new way. And it never makes sense. So it's consistent in that it doesn't ever make any goddamn sense. So in true Killapalooza fashion, we've talked forever about the first movie. Well, we have to set everything up. We're allowed. Yeah. So the second Wishmaster, uh, thankfully, we've saved stuff about the Wishmaster That's right. to talk about. Um, this is the end of... Andrew Divoff. Yeah, right. Uh, playing the Wishmaster. Who I loved in the first film. Yeah, really for sure. Dug for him. sure. Yeah, and uh, and so we have to say, I mean, you know, the first film, a lot of that rides on him and just how weird he is. And I think as we see, you know, the second movie, I mean, he's just so much better in the first. And if I had to take a guess as to why that is, I think it's one of those things where, you know, watching the second movie, I think he understands the role too well the second time around. The first time, it was just these little weird things. It almost seemed experimental. Just, I'll do this in this scene, I'll do this in this scene. In the second movie, that becomes repetitious, kind of predictable. You know, stuff like that weird smile of his. Yeah, and the look. 
Yeah, and the look, and that just became icons, and I think he felt the need to kind of repeat a lot of that stuff. And so it's not as much fun, you know, in the second movie as it is in right. the first one, because it's not as unpredictable. Uh, having said that, don't let the second movie tell you he wasn't awesome in the first movie, because he really was. Right. Other things in the second movie that are kind of interesting are, you know, we were talking about that internal consistency. Do you think they adhere to the wishes a little bit better in the second one? The second one is really strange because a lot of the wishes are really far-fetched. Sure, sure. And that's the one where it really starts dealing heavily with convoluted idiomatic phrases. Right. In so much, the one that really stands out to me as one that just like, it almost, it it seemed like he didn't know how to grant the wish until the dude wouldn't shut up, (laughs) is when he's he's in the laundry room of the prison. So Wishmaster goes to jail. Yeah. Another slasher first, I think. I don't think we've seen a slasher go to prison yet. I don't think so either. There's a really good film in there somewhere. Just a good slasher in prison, old school American horror idea. Sure. Send your screenplays to doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I would love to read that. So he's hanging out at this prison. I mean, he's just goofing off. Yeah. He's killing people, getting some wishes from some people who need wishes. He knows what's up. He doesn't care. This is the uh, the movie where the mythology changes a bit and he has to get, uh, you know, a thousand and one right. wishes. Sure. So which, he has which, to get a thousand and one souls. Which derives from the old 1001 Nights story, which goes back. I mean, there's parts of that in the whole Aladdin story and the King of Thieves and Alibaba and all that stuff. They like to point out what they're stealing sure. from. Exactly. There's this big motherfucker in the prison who I don't, he has these kickboxing buddies, like these twin Asian kickboxers. So when you say big motherfucker, you don't mean Tommy Lister. Right. uh, Tiny, you mean the other guy. The the smaller big motherfucker. Sure. And he's got these two Asian kickboxer buddies that are, I guess, his bodyguards, as if he wasn't able to defend himself. He's a giant. Yeah. So he decides that he's going to wish for drugs. He wants to get wasted. He wants to get wasted, fucked up, and then what's he... Stomped into the ground. Stomped into the ground. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So he says he wants to get wasted, and Wishmaster goes, wasted? Kind of looks at him. I can quizzically do that maybe I, and he's sure. you can you can see the wheels turning how am I going to do something with the word wasted how am I going to do that but the guy doesn't shut his fucking mouth yeah he ends up using a, the phrase stomped into the ground at which point wishmaster goes oh you got these kickboxer buddies that's easy yeah, I'm all right. over that dude I'm all although over that. I was hoping he would literally get stomped into the ground I was hoping so too but you know we've gotten so many literal translations of the wishes uh, let's just mix it up a little bit plus the dude doesn't die in a twist yeah he just gets really tired and bloody I think eventually he dies i think that's what we're meant to believe. souls get taken away so you have that one uh the wish in the beginning i wish i was never born right. which seems kind of odd here's the the line right that the film has trouble with because on one side of the line over here you have people who will literally wish very clear wish for something that will immediately kill them and that's the most comfortable but the most far-fetched who would wish in a in a situation that was terrifying i wish i was never born i mean i get that he's so scared he just Maybe something so terrible is happening to him. He wishes he was never. That seems like a weird thing for somebody to say. Mm -hmm. So that's a stretch. But when the wish is fulfilled, you see him being unborn, which is kind of weird. But then he's gone and you don't have to worry about how he's going to kill him by twist of whatever the wish may have been. And then you have the complete opposite side where the cop says freeze. Right. Which I believe is a request, a demand. It's a command. Yeah, it's not a... um, it's definitely not, I wish you would freeze. What it absolutely is not is, I wish I would freeze. Sorry, you know, you're right. That's, uh, that's where I was going with that. So the cop gets frozen, and that's definitely not what that command Not means. at all. So that's the complete, uh, you know, other side of that. So it's interesting to see where each of these wishes, um, I, I wouldn't say across a line, but let's say on a line, where all the way to the left is, you know, I wish I was never born, and all the way to the right is, you should freeze, oh, freezing you like freezing i will freeze you because that is your wish and that doesn't make any fucking sense either so kind of plot that out plot out that line as you're watching this movie and see at what points on the line um that would uh those wishes would fall Mm -hmm. so we handled most of the mythology stuff that changes a little bit also the the stone the opal thing what is it in this one the fire the stone of the secret fire it sounds like a harry potter Stone of the secret fire stone of the secret fire is what it's called it's not in a mystery box so it takes just the stone it takes one film to go from the box to the lament configuration yeah lament that's all that took And this is about the point, too, where the movies, I mean, it becomes really obvious that these movies are writing themselves. You know, maybe it's just because you have the rules outlined pretty, uh, they're pretty solid at this point. 
but I think it's the formula too. You know, it's just you're you're dancing around the wish. You get into as the wish master, right? You have a scene. You get into an interaction with somebody who's maybe in your way, or in this no, movie, he just, just needs to. Yeah, they're alive and therefore in his way. They're, they have a soul and therefore they become a commodity to you. Right. It's right. as if it's it's kind of like I don't know if you can get yourself there, but it's kind of like if you go out into the street one night as a mugger. I'm going to mug people today. Sure. You go out into the street, every person that walks by, it's not, oh, well, that person is clearly in my way. I'm going to mug them. It's, right. That person has it's an money, opportunity. I will mug them. And that's how the formula works. That's the beginning of the engagement. And then it becomes, I'm going to smile at you awkwardly and you're going to make fun of how I'm British or my shoes or whatever. And then eventually I'm going to say, that's nice. Let's talk about this instead. And right. it always starts that way. People never, you know, I would have even accepted if people kind of walked up to him and go, man, you know what I really wish for? But that never happens because that would be so far-fetched. Instead, they go, hey, you look like a real faggot. And he's like, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about what you would wish for. And it seems so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's just, you know, if someone said that to you, you would say, hold on, we were talking about the way you dress. We weren't talking about... And there's weird stuff, too, that, like, I feel like more people would just leave him alone. Sure. The thing, the thing you're talking about the shoes in the beginning. Yeah. I know, I mean, that, that was one of the weirder things, where the guy goes, I like your shoes. And he goes, do you wish for my shoes? <laughs> right. You could wish bigger than my shoes. And the guy, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine, like, if I went up to some guy, right? Dude, I like your shirt. Do you wish for my shirt? <laughs> right. Bye. Yeah, when you pull yourself out of uh, the world of the film, it doesn't make any sense and no one would ever... Anybody who asks me if I wish for something, right. I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I think and it's it would not almost because be, of this movie. I think it would almost be more amusing to see the reaction of a real person, which, oh, believe me, we will get to. But rather than fault the movie for this, I'm going to congratulate this whole series for just being the first one to take advantage of this. This is a plot that is so obvious. It's a gimmick that is so fucking obvious it had to exist. It's not a matter of if it exists or when will it. It's just as, as soon as it can be pressed to film, it has to happen. Someone just has to cash in on that. You know, the idea of evil genie who grants your wishes with a twist that kills you. I think everybody who's ever committed a single thought to paper, any kind of type of fiction, has had that idea in their mind. This is just the group of people we should applaud because they actually went out and they filmed it so that we could have an example of what right. that might be like. Sure. And then we can have conversations like this where mm -hmm. we go, how well is that done? Would we have done these other things? How would this operate in real life? How far-fetched is this? And so normally where we might think of how might a series be rebooted or how might it be reimagined, there's no doing that here. The only, the only imagination, the only idea really is Twisted Genie. Once that's been done, you know, hey, someone did that for us. That exists in the world now. You can get that on a DVD. Sure. And so its purpose has been served. But to talk about the character of this Wishmaster, you know, you mentioned him uh, in your description of just not understanding metaphor. And that's my favorite part about this character. I don't know that the movies intend for you to look at him that way. Yeah. But I like to think of him as an alien who just sure. does not understand how our, our speech works. But there is that moment where he's talking about, you know, please just wish for something. He starts yelling at people yeah. to make wishes. You know, a million dollars, which is reasonable, right? Sure. But please wish for anything, a million dollars, a bird's nest. And you go, hold on, hold on a second. A bird's nest. Can we just back up? Why would you wish for a bird's nest? And, and I, I remember seeing this in the film and conjecturing maybe earlier in the day. He like came upon some person and they're like, there's a bird's nest in that tree. And he looks up at it sees what he doesn't know what the fuck he's looking at he's yeah, never right. seen a bird's nest before sure, in his he's life. alien to the planet but what he does know is that that woman is enchanted by that bird's nest and he thinks ah a bird's nest i'll buy it at a high price sure so he's just out of touch with humanity yeah you know what i like to think is that in his head he's just coming up with unlikely ways to kill people so he says you know Wish for a million dollars. Yeah, I'll, I'll just shower you with so much money, you'll suffocate. Wish for a bird's nest. It'll fly apart and stab you all over your he, body. Or whatever the birds idea will he has for the bird's nest, I don't think you can come up with it. <laughs> well, you can't get there from here. No, no, that's probably correct. But in his mind, he has an idea for a bird's nest. And he's trying to use some uh, maybe some neuro-linguistic programming and just uh, get someone to ask for the bird's nest themselves. So right. they think it's their idea. Well, it's probably, they think that. He's probably doing that thing, too. Where, I don't know, I mean, everybody does it, where when there's something you actually want and it's kind of awkward to ask for, 
someone says, what do you want to do? And you're like, I don't know. We could watch a movie or have sex or like eat or something. Yeah, right. And you just kind of sneak the one you really want to do <laughs> right. right in the middle. And he's like, yeah, you could ask for a million bucks, a bird's nest, a new car. Maybe he's actually just a bird watcher. And he, he uh, wants someone to wish for the things that he wants in life. Won't someone please think of the gin? I can just see him driving down the road in his Ferrari with his bags of money and a nest of birds in his passenger seat. Perfect. What a great life he'd live. All right, can I bitch about something else really quick? Go ahead. All right, the movie does something awful and then kind of redeems itself in a backwards way. But uh, we didn't talk about our female lead. That's true. So um, up until this point, and for every movie, actually, there is a uh, a strong female lead. Let's use sure. the term strong. She's the waker that's... by the third film. Right, right. It's not uh, to contrast that to the role of the survivor girl who is running away all the time. This is usually someone who doesn't really understand what's going on. Right. And by the time they understand, they take hold of that and kind of fight them off. And one thing that's really, really strongly in common in the first three films is homework. They call mm-hmm. it out in the second film. He specifically says, oh, you've done your homework. Right. It, they do a lot of research because apparently gin, gins have a lot of background and it's readily available at your local library. I haven't been to the library since the dawn of WebZap Services Incorporated, so I wouldn't know what what's actually kept at the library. But I assume it's old tomes about uh, pseudo-religious mythology and uh, religion. That's what I wanted to get to, actually. So there's a lot of religious and, let's say, socially conservative messages in this film. Heavy. Heavy and nauseating. You know, the religious stuff, surprisingly, maybe to listeners of the show, but while it is obvious, I think it's forgivable. We've seen movies like The Prophecy that revolve, that really enshrine themselves. Constantine is a really good example. We kind of wrote that off in a world where angels exist. The rest right. of the film happens in that world. But I mean, I'll even take a movie that has religious messages beyond, you know, uh, I, I guess any movie that's set in a religious world also has religious messages. But even a movie like The Prophecy that's about good and evils, angels and demons, have, I'm just describing Constantine. You're right. They're the same movie. Totally forgivable. I'm not going to rant about those. There's, there's no point. That's fine. That's a fine thing to do in your movie because those are people that just have different ideas that are a little silly, and I, I feel sad for people that believe that stuff really exists. What actually turns my stomach is when we start talking about the ideas of purity. Right. And I thought it was maybe a message about sex, which is so laughable to me. I will, maybe that's religion too, right? Religion is just so laughable to me, I don't think about it, as is people who think that you know sexual purity is anything that should be celebrated. Right. That's just funny to me. Look at those people. They're missing out on a great time. And I am having that wonderful time behind their backs. That's fine. But they talk about her being pure and they don't mean sexually. She goes into the bathroom and she starts taking out her piercings. Right. And, you know, doing her hair different and getting taking rid of out all her the dreadlocks, taking off the yeah, makeup, cutting off the her pinky punky finger, makeup all the and usual stuff. purity well, stuff. Well, so we start with, um, you know, we can joke about it being a, a bad film or having a bad message or whatever. But then it becomes a film that is wrong. It's no longer we're joking and laughing and having a good time. When the message starts to be people with piercings are impure and bad, uh, that's just disgusting to me. That's so narrow-minded. There's just no reason for that system of, um, it seems like, superstitious beliefs. I mean, there's so little. It's akin to me uh, to, you know, walking under a ladder. Uh, Walking under a ladder makes more sense because something might fall on you, right? But you see a black cat and you're going to have a bad day. You see a person with a piercing, and they're somehow impure, unfit. They're old. closer to the devil than you are, oh if you don't have God, a piercing. God, I can't stand that stuff. And I couldn't stand it before I had piercings or tattoos, and that obviously didn't. It's almost psychologically the boomerang effect. I think I might just have yeah. tattoos and piercings. Maybe I enjoy that aesthetic, but mostly it's a middle finger to those people, because I can't stand right. that type of thinking. There's just no reason for it. And without logic, our society doesn't exist. But it even goes beyond being wrong. It goes to being incorrect. At some point, she chops off her pinky finger. And I mean, so there was a moment, we're sitting here on the couch watching this, and I'm going, oh, she's taking out her tattoo, she's cleaning up. You know, who is this this movie even trying to appeal to, was my thought. Because I just thought everybody who watched horror movies looks like myself, Mm -hmm. looks like a weirdo. Looks unfit for society like you and I yeah, do. right, exactly. I, I just thought they were all, you know, us. I, we've been to, you know, horror conventions mm-hmm. and music box stuff. And it's whatever. basically there's, us in t-shirts. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of weirdos. There's a lot of weirdos. And so that's what I figure the audience is. Who is this movie preaching to? That is really going through my head. 
Maybe it's trying to convert people. I don't know. The thing that upset you is when she goes to cut off her finger. I'm upset because I think this is this is morally bankrupt sure. and something's wrong. And you just go, wait, you don't have to cut off your finger. So what's going through your head when you're seeing this? Are I'm just wondering, wondering why? I'm wondering why her pinky finger is impure. I wonder I, honestly, I want to see the back the flashback where she did an impure thing with her pinky finger. Like, I would love to see that. Stuck it up some dude's asshole or something. Uh, you know, that was really sexy until you had to go there. I guess it's still a little bit sexy, but we don't have to focus on that. Yeah, so I don't know why she's cutting off her pinky finger. That was never really revealed to me. It's some kind of religious rite. I think rite, it was a sacrifice. I don't understand. She had to sacrifice her pinky finger for purity. Lamb's blood, something. Don't know. But the movie kind of comes back around because after, or maybe this is an excuse, she goes to kill the Wishmaster now being pure because that uh-huh. was the problem. She wasn't pure. And she can't kill him. Right. In my mind. This is how I justify it. I'm going to pitch this to you okay, and let me know go. if this is what you were thinking. She goes, oh, I couldn't kill him because I wasn't pure. I guess the purity wasn't in my tattoos and piercings, but instead because I fucking murdered a man trying yeah. to steal exactly. jewels. Sure. And so when she corrects that wrong through her wishes, that's the point where she can then defeat the Wishmaster. Uh-huh. So did we end up on top? Are we okay there? Yeah, I think that's fine. One thing that I'm still not okay with, there's actually two things, and one deals directly with the mythology introduced in the second film. The other one has to do with where the djinn is conducting his business. Oh, good. I'm anxious they're here. Both, they're both connected. Mm-hmm. So about halfway through the film, we find out that he has to collect a thousand and one souls. We don't know why he never does it. doesn't matter. He gets... 201 of them taken care of at some point in his lifetime in the prison so then he goes to a casino gets a blanket wish from the casino owner Mm -hmm. and bam 200 souls ah so cheap people just start winning because basically here's the explanation by going into a casino you wish you would win yeah it's an understood wish yes and therefore implied wish there's a lot of those that show up and therefore everybody loses their soul because he lets them all win yeah and so sucks to be anybody involved with the casino but as if that's not bad enough he's not on the floor watching all this shit happen he is up in his gin office yeah he has a gin office in the real it's a dimly lit room with a massive desk and a huge fucking gazelle skull yeah, behind right. him. Oh, well, that came with the room, actually. Sure. To go back to the scenes that don't, they just stick him in there for no mm-hmm. reason. You know, I'm telling you. The eyeball you, scene. Exactly. The eyeball scene. It cuts to this room. He's got his back to the camera. He swivels in his chair like an Inspector Gadget villain. Stares at the camera. In his hand makes the, the stone appear. The says, stone of the secret fire. Sure. Says, Magic. Yeah, and, and then, then it, it disappears vanishes. again back to the casino. No, no, no. It appears, I believe he vanishes it again. He palms it in his hand uh, or, you know, he might be using a, another method for this. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to make claims that I can't substantiate, but uh, it disappears from his hand and he looks at the camera and says magic. There's no reason for him to be in there. There's no reason for this scene to take place. There's no reason for any of this, Michael. It doesn't make fucking sense. And I'm all right with those scenes. I love those yeah, scenes it was enjoyable. because of how stupid they are. The thing I'm not all right with is the blanket wish in the casino. Yeah. I told you that the second it came on. I said, he better not just be able to make everybody win and then bam, 800. And I guess it's okay because he only gets, what, another 200? But that's apparently enough. So he scores he tried 401 hard. out of 1,001. And tried real hard doing it. And I don't even know what those souls would have been. Is, is that like a race? Like you either get the three wishes or you get 1,001 souls I have no idea what's going on. Can we move on yet? There's one more thing because we're wrapping up what happens in the end of both the first and second films. Oh, yeah. Which is the main character. I'm not going to make this a big deal. I'm not going to make this long because everybody will know as soon as I say it that you can take your opinion from it. Both films end with the main character wishing the film never happened. Yeah. Moving on to the third film. Third film is directed by Chris Angel. Chris Moving Angel. on to the fourth film. Oh, sorry. So it's not Mind Freak Chris Angel. It's not Mind Freak Chris that Angel. That never really caught on in the way that what a twist did in the beginning of the show. Too bad. And there's just so many opportunities to use it throughout the Wishmaster films. But uh, it's a different Chris Angel who is not responsible for Mind Freak, who is, uh, in fact, not a magician at all, as far as I'm I aware. I would argue. But he did do the next two. Very similar to another franchise, Hellraiser. How have we gone through two movies and not mentioned Hellraiser yet? Similar to Hellraiser, where uh, two of the movies toward the end, if not, I believe it was the last two, wasn't it? That were made back to back. Also, speaking of Hellraiser, this film starts with a fucking puzzle box. It does start with the puzzle box. That's a little weird. So we've been ripping off some Hellraiser stuff left and right. I'm never one to talk about ripping off, you know, when certain things rip off other things. 
Because that is saying you know something about someone's intentions. Mm -hmm. And without knowing very clearly what someone's intentions are, I feel uncomfortable saying that. Having put that out there... I, difficult not to think so. Yeah, That's it's... That's really all there is to... You, I mean, if you don't want to accuse them, all you can, all you can do is raise a brow. There's, and, there's and, two brows raised, I think. And just wonder... What have they been... Because it's a franchise that starts with Robert England, Tony Todd, and Kane Hodder, you have to wonder if they have never even fucking seen the cover of Hellraiser. Well, and it's another thing to rip off of Star Wars, but to rip off your direct-to-DVD brethren... Yeah. I mean, they're sitting on the shelf right next sure. to you. Have you no shame? Yeah, I mean, if you were ripping them off. If not, I mean, my mistake. I'm sorry. So the score was probably the most amusing thing about this. Right. Um, we'll talk more about the Dad fake Zimmer score, the uh, the fake music in the um, in the next movie. But the score itself in this movie was this kind of um, it was you know as if it was typical movie horror low budget score laid on top of drum loops from. Uh, did you ever use? And I know you do some mixing and stuff. You remember in the 90s that program Acid? Yes. I think Sony bought it out, or yeah. it became Vegas, or something happened there. Yeah, those shitty drum loops, yep. uh, those techno electronic kind of loops, mm -hmm. it's that stuff. I don't know where it came from or why it's in here. It's beautiful, Michael. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. So here's something we need to talk about, and this is Killapalooza history. While we are uh, continuing on the Killapalooza, bringing it back, we need to talk about this. We have never done a franchise quite like this. Well, we haven't seen any of these movies. Nope, neither of I us. I had not seen one of the Wishmaster Neither movies. had I. And there's only four of them. Four of them. So having never seen these before, I mean, you knew a little bit more. You kind of brought this to the table. Sure. You said, hey, these giants are in them. The, uh -huh. the Kane Hodder, the Tony Todd, the sure. Robert Inglis. Little did we know, only the first Brief movie. cameos uh, in the first film. Yeah. And this is kind of a franchise that celebrates the other slashers, especially that first movie, bringing in all the other roles. So now we get to the third movie. And the only constant has not been Tony Todd or Kane Hodder or Robert England or even Ted Raimi, who, I mean, come on, you can get Ted Raimi back, please. Right. Kill him in the beginning of every movie. Oh, that would have been great. But I'm not going to fault the series for doing that. Whatever. Uh, they've been getting back the same Wishmaster over and over. And uh, by over and over, I mean the first two movies. In the third movie, we're sitting here wondering, oh, what will the Wishmaster look like? Is it going to be the same person? Is it going to be a person at all? You know, is it going to be a demon? Is there just going to be a demon the whole Possibly time? Possibly a new demon altogether. Right. Will there be, uh, you know, will there even be a Wishmaster? Are they going to get around that somehow? And uh, I think they might have went with the lamest option, which is John Novak for a couple scenes. Yep. They come back and you and I, uh, you know, both as the, the credits were going, because we're just watching these things back to back. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, no time in between. So as we're kind of winding down from the credits of the last film and going into the credits of this one... We're um, just shooting really quick because we've never had this opportunity allowed talking to each other uh, about this franchise we haven't seen going, what would be the best option? What would be the worst option? Um, where are you placing your bets? And I think of all the things that kind of were exchanged between you and I, the, the single thing we agreed on is, well, as long as it's not just the monster makeup the whole time, because that would be really, yeah. really lame. And that's sort of what happened. It's pretty much what happens. I mean, they, they, they kind of, do the same thing they did in the earlier films where he takes a face and then that face lets him turn into the whole body of yeah the uh the jason nine kind right. of thing um the smallville's uh jason connery i'd say that but i don't actually know anything about yeah smallville. he's probably i i don't know he's sean maybe, connery's jason connery how about we call him that well yeah sean connery's jason connery it's uh sean connery's son yeah and um, he's not terrible, actually. No, he's... I didn't like the character he was before he... I mean, we spend five minutes with the character, so I don't mm -hmm. know. But before he's Wishmaster. Once he's Wishmaster, it takes a little adjusting getting into the new mood that they're setting yeah. here. But I think he does an adequate job. That's how job. I felt about the fourth film, too. Not to get into it prematurely, but right, I think right. successfully, I like the Wishmaster... When he's in a person's body. Right. Consistently. In all four films. Not when he's the rubbery, weird, Right, with the weirdo thing. tentacles on his head. Yeah, you know, by the time we get to this Angel showdown, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. This, this has happened very rarely. Um, maybe never on the show. Maybe never in my life, to be honest. 
Uh, I was actually embarrassed to be watching. Yeah, this movie. it was kind of shameful. We had paused it at one point and then <laughs> turned it back on, and I was like, if anybody had just come in, oh my god, and seen what was going on right now, yeah, I would really have a hard time defending like myself, let alone the fucking film. Sure, it's beyond the film. It's why are you two dorks watching mm-hmm. this? I mean, seriously, the the monster makeup and the angel sword scene. It's like something you catch, uh, you know, after school when you're 11 years old. I mean, I've rarely been this embarrassed to watch a movie. And I was thinking to myself, thank fuck no one is coming in here to watch this with us today. We're just going to, you know, hammer out the show and be done with it. But it is going on the internet. Right. And everybody's going to know. But And so actually, maybe lots of people will watch it. Hopefully no one will watch The Third Wishmaster. Not to say it's entirely bad, but these It's entirely these moments, bad. I will say it's entirely bad. The cheesy moments are too hard to defend. I just can't. The, the amount of camp there. It's not a kind of camp that's okay. It's a very specific breed right. of camp that feels like I'm way too old to be watched. It's sure. as if someone caught me watching Pokemon. Sure. I mean, it would be even worse than that because that's almost got some kind of right. weird, ironic sure. value to it. Yep. We throw out Power Rangers a lot, right? Yeah. Because that's really yeah. kind of what... You know, we're also talking about uh, Angel, which I haven't mm-hmm. seen, and Smallville, which I don't know anything right. about. I'm trying to figure out where this fits. You know, what is this movie? Yeah. And that's about the closest thing that yeah. that I could come I mean, to. I mean, awkward. I, most of what goes on in the film is entirely a waste. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to come off too harshly, but really the film doesn't need to happen. No. There are good parts of the film. Nipples. Are they worth watching the film? I believe nipples is what you're getting nipples. to. But... Among other things, like there, I, I can think of two off the top of my head. Sure, but they're not worth the whole film. Oh no! One is the fucking scene where the chick's throwing up all over the the floor in the church. Okay, that, interesting. Because that made me uncomfortable. Sure. And thank you, job. art. Yeah. So thank you, art. That, I love it. That made me uncomfortable, and so that was absolutely well done. Worth the film, not even close. The other thing that I really liked is when they actually called out wish specificity. Yeah. They didn't do anything with it, which no. was a total bust. And again, it makes it a completely unnecessary film, but they at least said, you need to be more specific with your wishes. That's kind of where you realize, okay, the djinn knows that sure. he can play off people's words at this point. Because it didn't seem uh, before this that there was any reason that he was... It didn't seem that he knew that someone could make a good wish. Right. Even though he had been defeated the first and second time around... It seemed like maybe his memory was completely erased, and he thought, no matter what they wish for, I will always win. At this point, he was kind of mocking them, saying, you know, if you could be more specific, maybe this wouldn't be so bad for you. And occasionally you see people, not necessarily through wishes, but there are people who get in his path that don't completely get torn apart, or who at least die lesser deaths than some of the other people who don't think too cautiously about their wish. Part of the mythology that we haven't talked about yet is where you could see what the djinn is seeing. Uh, I think that, you know, by this time, we've become so accustomed to that, we could have really used a more interesting twist on this. And, you know, we get it a little bit. Um, it develops slightly. You know, he's using it to mock the girl. He, uh, he realizes that if he's going around and killing other students, killing her loved ones, that he can say, oh, they're going through pain and torture, you can just wish this away. Right. So he's now aware that she sees what he sees, something that's been going on in the other movies, but didn't really seem like there was a reason for that other than to show how tortured the uh, the lead is. But this is where I think they could have taken a serious page from one of the Hellraiser movies. I mean, we made fun of those for getting so convoluted, but there was a sort of mystery element that came about using the canon of the series, yeah. using the different elements that we knew to be true, they would manipulate those things like uh, dreams. I mean, it's an easy one, but they could manipulate different things that are happening in dreams to make characters second guess or what have you. You know, certainly we could have done something. All right, so let's say she can see everything that he can see. Maybe she's using that to gather clues about what he's going to do next or how to avoid him or what his weaknesses are. I mean, this is just stuff I'm coming up of, you know, off the top of my head with. But certainly having a portal into what he's doing while he's chasing you around seems like it should be of a little bit more value. You know what I mean? And the only time there's ever any use is he's kind of like, I'm killing your friend. You better wish it doesn't happen. Instead, instead, Michael, uh, they're doing montages in books. They're doing reading montages. montages. 
don't do a homework montage when you could be learning about the killer. But it's, you know, she's sitting there in, in fucking study hall in the library going, God, I wish I didn't have to see everything he's seeing so I could read this book and learn about him. I mean, come on, movie. What are you doing to me? And there's another thing. And, you know, I'm just going to point this out briefly. The next movie mentions it. But uh, the power of the paradox right. is really when you're talking about, you know, just doing this. I talked about earlier the idea that this had to exist, that this was an inevitable film sure. and it just came about out of the collective consciousness of fiction writing mm-hmm. because everybody thinks about it. Part of expanding this as a good thought experiment, and maybe we can just focus on that more because we're double feature and we love thought experiments around here, but using a paradox to destroy the Wishmaster brilliant that would have been so awesome you get three wishes right right and so the first thing whenever somebody says three wishes the first clause that i think always has to go into effect and it shouldn't be understood you should have to say so why not wish for more wishes sure certainly and that's something that's covered a lot of times when you deal with wish movies but not in this movie you mentioned another thing the Uh, corn dog the corn dog yeah so why why not wish that the gin make a corn dog so big he couldn't eat it and once that corn dog is made, you wish he would eat it. There you have a paradox. Very simple, beautiful, thank you, Michael, elegant paradox that you have built. Giant corn dog, you cannot eat corn dog. Those two things negate one another. How can they exist in the same world at the same time? And maybe that paradox, to, I would love to see a slasher that's destroyed by paradoxes. That could be my favorite slasher. Instead, you get, you know, Wishmaster teaching a class, Angel Showdown. Uh, at some point, you know, there's a sword. He's no longer granting wishes. He just hides a, a woman's um, head in a rat cage for some strange reason. You know, her wish is that she could hide or whatever, and she ends up in a with her head in a rat cage. It doesn't make she any just, sense. Her, eye, her eyelids and lips get chewed off. That's that's hiding to the djinn in the third film. We're just trying to get this series back on track, which makes the fourth film very interesting. And... uh I, I tell you, man, I don't even know where to start on this thing. It's a weird film, isn't it? It is. It's, it's weird. A very odd piece of movie making. I don't know where to begin. Well, let's start with the directing. The directing doesn't change. It's okay. the same direction from the third film. It's the same director from the third film. Okay, so we're talking about a lot of things here. Do you mean that the franchise is steering the same direction? Do you mean that the, I mean the style the physical of job... the film? Okay, sure. The acting isn't great. The lighting is weird. Everything still looks Saturday yeah. morning TV show. Yeah. It's apparently dealing with more adult themes, but it's still dealing with it in a very adolescent way. That is all not necessarily a credit to the film, and that's fine because it stands out in ways that I wouldn't have expected by the fourth Wishmaster film to ever come around. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, it fools us. We're back once again to the Wishmaster masquerading as a new guy. And, I mean, this guy is even more boring than the last guy. You know, Jin kills him, and I'm thinking, oh, no way, not that guy. Don't put on that guy's face. He is so fucking boring. Please don't do it. Another thing you pointed out as we were watching it is where we've come from the first movie right. with our actors. Yeah, because by the fourth movie, Robert England, Tony Todd, and Kane Hodder. Those were the big three that reeled us in. Are replaced by boring lawyer Jin, man in wheelchair, chick with problems. Oh my God, make it stop. And you know, at least the two Hellraiser movies back to back, they look very, very different. They were about completely different things. Now, that was us being crabby, and this is another reason we try not to be crabby as we're watching or talking about these movies, because movies have the capacity to surprise you. They have that power. That's why we watch every single thing from a franchise, just waiting for a surprise, and I was really waiting here because, you know, Children of the Corn, you'd seen a couple of those, but hadn't seen them all, and I didn't know, you know, we would get surprised together. Everybody who watched Uh those, our producer was over that day, everybody was there, and we would all experience these surprises together. Today we're watching these and neither of us had seen them. You know, you are, you're so bad about this too. If one takes place in space, ever since Jason, there has to be a joke about that because you always think that I cannot believe where these movies are (laughs) going to go and your excitement, you can't hold it in. You just go, uh, you know, wait till they get in space. And that's my cue to say in space, haha, that won't happen. Or Leprechaun, oh, they're going to be in space by the third one. And I think, oh, that's not true. And then they're in space by the third one. And it's really really fucking funny so in your mind you must make a judgment call that i could watch eric's uh delights here as this happens or i could tell him this now so that when it happens he will be even more surprised right with this movie 
neither of us had seen it. So we never knew when a space moment was coming. Right. We never knew when any of this would show up. And even if we did know that it was going to do one, if someone told us there's one weird thing that's going to happen toward the end, we never saw this coming. Uh-huh. I mean, this is uh, in a movie that looks sort of like the other movies. It's very bizarre. It takes a, a serious turn, I guess. Uh-huh. That's, that's sure. uh, where the franchise goes. We see these kids messing around. They're fucking in a weird fucking scene. Yeah. It stays on the fucking scene for quite a long time. And then the bed breaks. And then the bed breaks. That's what we're waiting for. That's the gag why we're sticking with that scene, I guess. And then it's three years later. And oh, see, they're super adults now. And I mean, they're really adults. Yeah, they are. They went from 16 to 30. Uh, you know, she's going in this lawyer's house. I didn't even know if it was the same guy at first because... Because you don't know nice, faces. Yeah, a nice fancy house. And they're trying to make them look different and... I don't know. So, you know, they're talking about settlements and mortgages and inventory and stuff. It's so adult and so dry. And I'm thinking, why would they go here right. with this movie? But it's actually kind of interesting. Yeah. They're talking about some really specific issues. Well, so on a non-Wishmaster level, kind of what's going on is uh, there's this lawyer dude who may or may not be sweet on this woman yet. You don't right. know. And she is married in a relationship with wheelchair man who is her boyfriend of three years at least yeah but he's in a wheelchair he's pushing her away he's having a hard time dealing with not being able to walk that's tough shit yeah that's i'm not uh, saying that's tough shit to him i'm saying that's tough shit to deal with that shit is very tough and that's what's just going on on a character level then we introduce the wish master and things instead of turning into make a wish 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 it turns into an actual complex storyline sure it gets complicated by the fact there's this new element the wishmaster takes over the lawyer and instead of turning into scary wishmaster and scaring her into making wishes he's subtly you know what what, what do you want i'll do it yeah totally. yeah right what do you want he's manipulating her and she makes all three wishes in this film it yeah finally fucking happens and then there's a secondary mind freak of the gins in love yeah. Kind of right. Like he's half in love, but she, then there's this tertiary twist that I didn't pick up until the end. And I think that this is brilliant. They do this thing where her final wish is that she wishes that she could love him for who he really is, which turns the whole thing on his head because her wish is to herself toward him. It's almost a paradox. Beautifully. It's almost a paradox. And we are still talking about Wishmaster. Could you just say that sentence again about loving for who, what was that? It's basically the, that she has to, she she asks him to help her love him. She asks him for something out of his power. For who he really is. I, we're talking about Wishmaster. Yeah. That's a little bit, that's really bizarre. It's not a little bizarre. It's really, really bizarre, but something that's definitely worth applauding. To take that kind of approach, to tell that particular story using this i mean it's not even telling that particular story because whatever that's fine but using this franchise using these characters is really bizarre and i mean beyond that we didn't get into the the personal you know adults uh storytelling too much but it's you know take there there's an issue that comes up that's complicated by the wishmaster and this is one of the things that's most interesting to me because it's not just tacking the wishmaster on to an adult story which is how i theorize this got made I'm thinking this crew was contracted for two films. They made one bullshit film and then they wanted to do their own movie, but it had to be a Wishmaster film. So rather than fight to get their own movie made, they just sort of did some Wishmaster tie-ins. They wrote them into a couple Mm -hmm. scenes and they kind of figured that out much in the way that some of the Hellraiser movies don't, but, but better, but more artful than Hellraiser, you know, where, what was it? The the fourth or the fifth one where he's in it for 12, 12 seconds. And uh, and you're going, this isn't really a Hellraiser movie. This is really a Wishmaster film. He's very important to these plots, but I could see where maybe he was written in. But again, I have no idea. So right. this is all speculation. So one of the issues that comes up uh, to think about a thought experiment and then to you know do something that can only be done really in a thought experiment or something far-fetched, what if you are taking care of someone, right? You're with someone, you love them, something happens, and you grow so accustomed to taking care of them and then they're healed. That is a dynamic that, you know, you see it in the real world occasionally. You see it both with nursing someone back to health. You see it in very damaged relationships or uh, commonly say someone has a drug problem or an alcohol problem and you spend your, you know, your relationship nursing them and they get over their drug problem. 
that seriously changes your role in their life. Mm-hmm. You are no longer the well, and know, the weight that they have on yours. Yes, yeah, certainly. And so maybe you have uh, less dependence on one another, or maybe you no longer play a paternal figure that was important. Or, you know, or and th- that can result in you having forgotten your original role. That can certainly. result in you realizing that the love that you once had as kind of equals exists now as more of a caretaker. Right. caretakey right. thing and and that's all okay so that's in a wishmaster film we yeah. have to keep recanting i know I that know. this it's is weird, a wishmaster movie that's dealing with these issues that I, we haven't even fucking dealt with we do a podcast here yeah when we're not doing a killapalooza we're doing a podcast i don't know if any of you listeners that are listening to this killapalooza are familiar i think they all went in hibernation after the i don't even remember what the last killapalooza was that's how long ago it was it was hellraiser wasn't it yeah i think it was okay. yeah and and we don't we talk about a lot of films. We talk about the issues that a lot of films cover. And here we are in Wishmaster 4, something brand new. Yeah. Something we've never talked about before. That kind of, maybe on Misery. You know, maybe a couple. Right. Not, no, not even. Because that's the not the same thing. Misery was that same physical circumstance of nursing someone to health. But that's not what was going on under that story at all. But sure enough, that's what's happening here. And so the Wishmaster heals him. You know, heals his legs. Right. Second wish. That's the second wish. Yeah. And so that changes their whole dynamic. There's a power shift there. There's jealousy issues. There is, you know, she is no longer uh, paternal. She's no longer his caretaker. He no longer answers to her. Right. Well, because he's free now. Everything. Yeah. Right. Right. And so there's a lot of issues between the two of them. That might sound like, oh, there's nothing there for Wishmaster fans. I don't even believe I'm using the term Wishmaster fans, but I'm sure these people exist. But where that comes back around is because, as you said, he is artfully, uh, he's manipulating them. You know, this isn't just a wish that he's granting so he can take a soul. This is also part of the manipulation because that's going to break up the static chemistry that they have. That's going to break up the comfortable situation they're in, which isn't the best situation, but is comfortable, is what they know. And he knows he can use that turmoil I'm, it's it's amazing that yeah. we're still. I this is yeah. blowing my mind, but I'm going to try and power through this. Uh, Wishmaster film. He's using that turmoil to wedge himself even more into their relationship. Right. He's causing that chaos so he can get in there, especially towards the end where he has to make her love him. Right. Beauty and the Beast style. They sure. even kind of make that um, make that reference yeah. so that he can create hell on earth right and there's or be, he even he even at one point uses the phrase be free so maybe he gets out of jindom yeah if right. she ends up loving him there's there's kind of a lot of speculation as to what really happens what's well, the lamp thing right sure. to, to go back to you right. know the the reference with the clothing shop yeah. the 101 uh, yeah 101, exactly that's there. 101 what am i talking about 1001 um you know the the aladdin stuff the idea being locked in the lamp being confined to the space, wanting freedom. Right. I mean, that's inevitably where any of the the stories based on a sure. genie kind of eventually turn to. Right. And so that's just saying, hey, you know my motivation. You've right. seen the second fucking Disney Aladdin movie. You know where this entire giant uh-huh. story arc. And this movie makes the rest of the movies feel like part of a continuous uh-huh. story arc. He's talking about being free now. We already know that. He just needs to say, yeah, it's it's what you suspected. Yeah. I want to be free. Right. And that's his rationale. That's sure. his motivation sure. for everything he's doing. There's two more layers. There's an upper layer, which is disgusting, and a lower layer, which is great. The upper layer involves more swords and more gins. Yeah, it does. I don't really want to get into it. It has to do with this kind of fucked up mythology where all the gins are kind of rooting for him. And then there's this guy with a sword named the Hunter who has to stop the Jins. It feels forced. It feels it's, like what you expect out of any of these angel things. It's wasted. It's unnecessary. And it, it really, like, it, and I mean wasted entirely. I don't mean stomped into the ground wasted. I mean regularly wasted because it's in the movie and it doesn't matter. It's dogma. It's the second Predator film. Right. It's all of that shit. It just kind of, it kind of takes the time so that the film isn't an hour long. Right. The other thing that I really like is that it's the gin in the real world. The the bouncer is what I'm speaking of specifically. He goes to the he goes to the strip club and there's this bouncer. Yeah, the bouncer is the guy who calls out the bullshit. Something that you had been begging them to do uh this whole time throughout all the movies. You and I both, I mean, there is a there's a definitely a line where we're saying mythology of the film isn't there a real person in here anywhere. And sometimes you don't want a real person. Sometimes a real person makes fun of Freddy's Christmas sweater, and you don't want that. And sometimes you do need a real person around. 
And I thought at the very least, when the movies are just starting to plug in different numbers into the same fucking formula, maybe we should throw a real person in here to mess around with the what would you do with wishes and why isn't this working and whatever. Just, you know, throw in a real person. And so the bouncer calls out the language, you know, calls out the, is that what you wish me to do bullshit? No one talks like that. That doesn't make any sense. People should look at him like he's a crazy homeless person in the street. People should, I need a better reference because only people who live in cities know what that's actually like. But when you talk to a real homeless, here's how you know what a real homeless person sounds like. What was that? The second film or the first one that had the first the homeless guy who wasn't the death curse guy. That is what a homeless person right. sounds. That's the kind of conversations you would actually have with a homeless person. Yeah, that was the first film. And so that's the the kind of stuff. When you hear this, you go, that guy's not all there. Something weird is going on. He's trying to walk me into a sick joke. Yeah. I, I'm not having any of this. And the bouncer calls him out on that. Why would you talk like that? Why would you say things like that? Eventually, when he turns into a gin demon, the bouncer seems pretty okay with it. So that's not too realistic. But we're not going for realism here. We're just looking to point out this one thing that the movie almost says, hey, we know the other movies have been doing this bullshit and right. getting away with it. We're going to point to that and say that wasn't OK. That was never OK. Even though the same team made the last film, they're even saying we made that last film to be different, to be another piece of that franchise. And here's what we didn't think was OK about that franchise. So the obvious question becomes, uh, you know, we're having fun with the franchise. I'm glad we saw these movies. I see a movie like this, and I start thinking, Leprechaun. Yeah. You remember we did the, I want to say the fourth Leprechaun movie was... That's space. Um, the fifth one was Hood. Yes. Okay. So we're doing Hood, and we're going... Um, that was surprisingly one of the more legitimate Leprechaun films. Was the Leprechaun kind of holding that story back? And we didn't question that too much here, but I do want to pose that to you here. Do you think Wishmaster was actually holding back the story that was happening? You know, I I think that it's probable. I think that without Wishmaster, you could have definitely dealt with a lot of the real issues that were going on. Sure. But they did a really artful job of also bringing up issues with the Wishmaster mythology, particularly the Paradox Wish and the whole love story, which it that's not what's important about it, but that it can exist, that there's kind of this weird link that they never touched on. It raises questions that it took four films to raise. They're not necessarily the most obvious questions, but it's not Wishmaster, you wish you die. All right, I'm going to align with you on that. I think that's pretty clear. I'm, you know what? I'll say the same thing I said about Mean Girls, uh, where we were talking about how Mean Girls could have elevated itself by entering another genre, but it did just enough to stay in the teen genre because the teen genre need that. On a smaller scale, I'm going to stay. We stayed in the Wishmaster franchise because the Wishmaster franchise could have done some more interesting things. Mm-hmm. And here's a glimpse of what they were. Right. Now, you could say the opposite. You could go back through and look at how, you know, when we talk about killer sex. I mean, that was one of the things that drew this back into being, you know, a hokey movie. Stuff like The Hunter. I mean, these different items that we would start to get really, really serious. And this happened very commonly in this movie. It got serious. We started thinking these uh, kind of analytical thoughts we've been talking about here about really deep hard issues and then there would be scatological humor yeah. or something akin to it in in the wishmaster universe uh something like killer sex that would sure. be so goofy or right. even just seeing him you know as the gin form the monster form fighting in the forest would be repulsive would really turn you off from these other ideas and provide such a harsh contrast uh that kind of pushed you away from those ideas but we wanted to stay within the Wishmaster universe. And so a lot of that stuff, maybe not necessary to the degree that it was, but whose call is that we didn't make the film? That's mm-hmm. not our call yep. to make. This is just something that exists. And, you know, we we're facing that now. So this has been a long Killapalooza, especially for four movies. Yeah. But God damn it, it has been too long. Yep. And we haven't even talked a lot of Killapalooza shop stuff. It's just mostly been, you know, on topic with Wishmaster. I want to pull back a little bit and uh, we'll still keep it on topic, but I want to talk to you about um, something we did a long time ago that we haven't returned to, but it was kind of an interesting idea. I'd like to know what else you might do with this franchise. We've done, uh, it's only been four movies, rather short. We've talked about a lot of ideas, you know, to say the movies did this, which was kind of interesting. 
They did this, which was uh, definitely very questionable. Um, if you had to take this movie forward, if you had to take this franchise forward, uh, where would you go from here? Well, I think I can I can think of a few things off the top of my head. Sure. I would definitely explore some of the things. I think one thing that I would really do, and I know that it's silly and people will that people will totally think that immediately it sounds dumb. I would have a film where someone wished for more wishes. Really? Yes. All right. So what does that accomplish to you? Well, here's the thing is if if the waker, so we're going to go totally wish master world on this. All right. The waker gets three wishes. Yeah. They wish for more wishes and the djinn is obliged because for by some, they have to. That's the rules. It's not like the third movie where yeah. he just says, that wish is dumb. I'm not yeah. giving it to you. Exactly. He wishes, the, the waker wishes for more wishes. So then we can kind of get this dichotomy where the djinn is now under someone's thumb. Okay. They're still the bad guy, but they can't kill the waker and sure. they also have to protect the waker. Sure. So we have this dichotomy where there's... Someone who's clearly greedy because they wish for more wishes. So they're probably wishing for bullshit stuff and they don't have to be the good guy anymore. Right. We can hate them because they got away with the cliche. Exactly. I love that you're using something. So this is very in the vein of Wishmaster using a cliche idea, wishing for more wishes, something that is uh, certainly eye rolling. But that's definitely a move that wish you could understand Wishmaster addressing that. And I think that's probably why you're surprised it doesn't show up. And you're using that as an excuse to assert power over who was formerly exactly. the That's a clever idea. And then you have the interesting dynamic where the Wishmaster is still going to be going around taking souls. Because, uh-huh. I mean, he's not on the clock 24-7. Sure. And so then you're going to have to have some other troop of people who not only have to bring down the Wishmaster, but also the Waker. Right. And they also have to use the fact that the Waker is the only one that can stop the Wishmaster. And the Waker's like, I've got a billion wishes. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to listen to you. I can wish you away. And you have, a, it. I, I mean, I don't know how I would necessarily solve the problem off the yeah. top of my head. But I can say that I think it'd be an interesting idea to explore. Yeah, there's more ground that can be covered. I mean, um, I haven't seen a lot of stuff about doing another Wishmaster film. I honestly don't think enough people care. This isn't a, a franchise that's on a lot of people's radar. It certainly got us thinking about different things. Mm-hmm. And this seems to be, you know, uh, while we're running with this in in slasherdom, maybe this is something not a lot of slasher movies are exploring and we could continue to sure. perform thought experiments and to try out different ideas this way. Uh, the only thing I would maybe change about the last film or a direction I want to see it go is to see him win. Right. And I, I thought maybe we would get to that point. Um, but uh, you know, with any slasher franchise, we never see anybody win. That's just not something that happens. And I want to know, you know, that would certainly change the direction. Sometimes we launch them in, into space. Sometimes we pull a Jason 10 move, but let's put them in gin world. Yeah. Let's just say that, you know what? This is obviously fiction. We saw from the bouncer that there's only one person from our real world in this fiction. So why don't we just alter the fiction? Why don't we create some alternate history? Why don't we say that in this specific year, at this specific time, with this president in this country, when these things were going on in the world, suddenly the gin won, and that changed everything, and move forward from there. I mean, that would be a really interesting idea to me, just to switch up the entire franchise, sure. and I'd like to see that. I'd like to see where that takes it. You, you kind of went the route of saying here's an interesting here's something that could create an interesting film with more ideas and in my head i'm going what else can we do to make this a more legitimate slasher film or to a franchise rather or just to say what other slasher direction can we go and that's that's kind of uh where my mind is on that one i'd love to hear other people's ideas absolutely as always double feature show at gmail.com especially if you drug yourself through all four of these films uh, this is the part where you did the work, and now we just get to chat. So send us an email. Awesome. Also, very briefly, is this the worst franchise we've ever done? Nope. All right, looking forward to another Killapalooza. Uh, we got a couple more ideas for yeah. Killapaloozas. We ha- we have at least the rest of year three figured out yeah. as far as what we're going to do. When we get to year four, then we're kind of fucked again. I and, have a couple we'll ideas out. for four, but oh, part you? of it's going to rely on how many more sequels are getting made. Are we getting more into obscurity, or do you have some bigger ideas? Let's, we'll just kind of t- grab from one end, grab from the other. All right, All right. sounds like a plan. So it won't be too long. We're going to start doing these at normal pace again um, for the time being. And with so. the Music Box Massacre. 
Yeah, we, we we kind of decided Music Box Massacre is going out the window, which means one more Killapalooza for y'all. Turns out nobody gave a shit about the Music Box Massacre except that bullshit MC guy and yeah. fuck him. So um, a lot of different ideas about other festivals we could do or stuff like that. I don't want to do something so inclusive as to alienate, so inclusive as to alienate. I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. You know what I mean? I yeah. don't want to do something that's specific to Chicago or specific to a festival I don't want to do anything where we can't spoil it. That's just not our show anymore. That was an accident that happened in the first or second year, and that shit's out of here. Yep. So we're going to have plenty of room to do more Killapaloozas. That's what people like, and that's what we fucking like doing. So we'll figure more of that stuff out. Uh, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. That email address plugged a million times, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Um, of course, there's the donations. There's the donations. So that's going to end real, real soon. Even though the year's nowhere near up yet, uh, we are going to have to um, to pull those winners and start doing something else. So I don't have a date for that yet, but send a donation by going to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. And uh, I believe how we're going to do that is everybody who donates gets uh, entered into a thing. We pick out two people from said thing, and uh, those people get to pick movies. And then we're going to pair up some of the movies and do a show with that. So that show will be coming up before too long. In the meantime, donate.doublefeatureshow.com. We also have a thing for uh, subscribers That's right. who do that up there, but they probably already know what that thing is because <laughs> we've talked about it so much. All right. Well, that's we're not going to do another Killapalooza next time, right? No, I, I think we got something else. We're back to uh, double featuring. All right. So what's the double feature? Pulp Fiction and Sin City. Watch more fucking film. Bye.